Hey, how's it going? Today we are going to have our short introduction to uh, Rawls' Theory of Justice, John Rawls, American philosopher of the 20th century. And I think Rawls's theory will survive the test of time because he asks, he asks these questions that come up whenever anyone's talking about theories of justice. And the question, what is justice, is actually a very old question that goes back, whew, maybe 2,400, 2,500 years ago. Uh, Plato, in his book, The Republic, has this long uh, analysis and discourse on what is justice. So, uh uh, you would think after, you know, 2,400 years or however long it's been, there might be some consensus. Uh, but uh, depending on who you ask, you get different accounts of what justice is. Um, a few years back, there was a book that was published by Amartya Sen, the Nobel Prize winning economist called The Idea of Justice. And one of the primary players in his book is Rawls. I think Rawls will survive the test of time. Right, because he's asking these questions that are important for any theory of justice, um, which relate to two things. Two things we got to get out of today, if you are to understand Rawls's idea of justice as fairness. Uh, there are two principles to his theory, uh, and one has to do with what kind of rights any just society will grant its citizenry. And the other has to do with economic inequality. That is, how is wealth to be distributed? Now, one of the things that I do when I try to read an ethics theory or a philosophy or a political philosophy theory is I often ask, well, were there historical conditions that influenced the formulation of this approach to politics or ethics? Because sometimes you can get a lot of mileage out of that approach. So, for example, um, earlier we took a look at contract theory. And Rawls sees himself within the history of contract theory. Hobbes is very famous for initiating contract theory, uh, where we set up governments as a response to a state of nature. And Hobbes argues that a state of nature is so bad that justice is whatever the government says justice is, which is astonishing if you think about it, right? Because at one point he writes, there is no unjust law. <laughs> really? Um, and so you might ask yourself, well, what would lead anyone to say that there's no such thing as an unjust law? Because it almost seems like even a third grader can <laughs> understand that, right? Uh, that there can be unjust laws. But what he's saying is he's asking for order and stability and he wants everyone to obey the government. Um, and if you consider the context of when he's writing in the early 1650s, uh, in 1649, Charles I was decapitated. They chopped off his head and there was lots of political insurrection. And so he just wants stability and order. Hence, he... <laughs> He's the godfather of author authoritarianism in uh, political philosophy, right? So what I'm just trying to point out is that was a strange time, a desperate time. And desperate times may call for desperate political philosophies. And similarly, you could even, you know, go fast forward a little bit to the 19th century. You have people like Karl Marx who argue that there's no right to private property, <laughs> Which is, there's no right to private property? Okay, Carl, let's go into his apartment and start taking his stuff and see if he thinks he has a right to private property then. So what I mean to point out is Marx is also responding to a desperate time uh, historically after the Industrial Revolution when wealth generation shifted to factory works. There was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of really bad working conditions. So workers were didn't have any rights at all in the sense that, you know, there's no labor laws, no minimum wage, uh, no collective bargaining, nothing like that. So workers had it really bad. And so Marx winds up staking out this strange claim that we don't have a right to private property. Um, and so Marx, by the way, wind up influencing the history of uh, this kind of struggle in the Cold War between ideas of communism and free market societies. And one of the things that we just want to address in the context of Rawls' theory of justice is that um, in the, the Marxist critique of capitalism, 
uh, it winds up claiming that workers are exploited, which indeed they are uh, frequently. Um, but what Rawls's theory is trying to do is defend capitalism um, and set up a merit-based system. But he has a theory of justice uh, behind this. And he does, he makes special provisions to uh, protect uh, the, the least advantaged members of society in his theory of justice. So he, he tries to defend the poor, but he doesn't go Marxist, right? Uh, so look, there are, there are two different principles in Rawls's theory of justice. The first deals with rights, and everyone needs to have equal rights. And he believes um, that that's fair. This is why he's talking and writing about justice as fairness. Rawls, too, is influenced by his time, right? He's writing, he initially presents uh, his first uh, draft for justice as fairness at the American Philosophical Association in 1957, and eventually publishes this idea of justice in 1971. But during that period when he's writing is, you know, that's right in the civil rights era, Right. So one, when he's saying that, look, any just government must ensure equal distribution of rights to its citizens. This is kind of important if you want to be fair. Right. And, you know, this isn't a meta, deep metaphysical claim. You know, if you are playing on the playground and you have rules that apply differently to different people or like if you're playing baseball and everyone usually gets three strikes and then you're out of there. But if you get four strikes... Uh, ever, even kids can say, hey, wait a minute, that's not fair. So part of what he's doing, he's appealing to this intuitive idea that people have a sense of what is fair or unfair. And that's got to figure into his analysis, right? So equal distribution of rights. You can't have unequal distributions of rights. And that way, that's fair with respect to rights. And what he has in mind are... Uh, freedom of speech and assembly. He even says right to vote, right? Uh, and so he defends various types of civil liberties. So it's worth asking, in authoritarian countries, would that be considered fair, according to Rawls's theory of justice? Um, probably not, many of them, right? Uh, and then the other thing that he has to do with and this is equally important, by the way, even though he says there's a serial order of these two principles. So you can never get rid of the rights because rights are important for a theory of justice. Um, he also has this, uh, he addresses how will wealth be distributed, right? Um, and he says, look, economic inequalities are permissible as long as in principle there's a fair system set up. Uh, and so... Sometimes people will say, oh, capitalism, uh, some people make more money and some people make less no money. Well, Rawls is defending that as being fair. You need to have equality for rights, but if people have different amounts of money, that's consistent with his uh, theory of justice as fairness. However, he also says a couple of other things. Um, the least advantaged members of society should be able to expect some kind of compensatory benefits or that they get something out of the idea that we're going to have unequal uh, distribution of wealth. And that might meet, be reflected in social programs that are funded by the, the more wealthy, or maybe it has to do with just a progressive tax structure where the burden of taxes are, is put on the rich rather than the poor. Um, but he's not saying all economic inequalities are, are justified. So if rich people become richer and make the poor worse off, uh, so suppose you have a business that, I don't know, you, you have aluminum and you have bauxite mines and it pollutes the groundwater. That hurts poor people much more than anyone else, right? Rich people can buy bottled water or go to their other houses. So he's trying to make space for, the, for defending the poor. One last part. Um, he also points out that in principle, utilitarian philosophy, the idea that you can... Uh, set up something where the greatest happiness uh, is created uh, for the greatest number. He says if that isn't tapered with an analysis based in fairness, then you could justify things like slavery because you'd be saying, oh, we're exploiting a small few, but it re results in the greatest happiness for the greatest number. Okay, that's all we have for Rawls today. Peace.